Hi there, and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. One of the first things I did in my garden was to wrangle the running bamboo. But you know what? I love the clumping varieties of bamboo for their disciplined texture. Today, Meredith Giles from The Great Outdoors shows off the elegant bamboos to give your low-maintenance garden a new look. On tour, we visit the Nimitz Japanese Garden of Peace that symbolizes the friendship between two admirals and peace between two nations. At the National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, the Garden of Peace symbolizes the friendship between two admirals and peace between two nations. The museum was founded in 1968 to honor Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz in his birthplace and all those who served in the Pacific in World War II. In his early career, Nimitz met Japanese Admiral Togo, a friendship that continued until Togo's death in 1934. He considered himself a disciple of Togo's. He admired his strategy. It was something that they studied when he was in the Naval Academy. In response to Nimitz's contributions to the Japanese in honor of Togo, Japanese admirals and others raised funds to create the Garden of Peace. Douglas Hubbard, then executive director of the museum, was encouraged by President Johnson to initiate the proposal to the Japanese. They were very receptive to helping establish this wonderful, serene park of uh, peace. As a symbol of their respect for Admiral Nimitz and as a gift to the American people. Garden designer Take Tora Saito, esteemed for his work in Japan, brought to Fredericksburg a design that acknowledged the two men's friendship and respect. On site, Japanese craftsmen reassembled a replica of Togo's study that they had built in Japan. Like the original, they constructed it with pegs instead of nails. Saito worked alongside Fredericksburg gardeners, many who donated plants from their gardens. In their work, they celebrated a common ground shared by all cultures, a garden to refresh, soothe, and connect to the land and familial history. There are three main elements in the garden. Uh, the elements are the stones, the uh, water, and the plants. The gravel represents the infinite ocean and the, uh, the stones in the center form islands. Uh, and then it, the pattern is raked to represent waves. We have a circular pattern in the center that uh, represents a water funnel and that was in the original land, uh, architectural drafting and uh, that moves from place to place according to Mr. Saito's request. So we move it around as we rake, we move it into different areas. The stones on the island and in Japanese tradition are much more important than anything else in the, in the landscape design. The stones with their lichen uh, are uh, representative of tradition and uh, ancestors and age. And uh, when people come into the garden, uh, Mr. Saito said, stop and visit with the stones. That was one thing he'd ask. The shapes of the stones were hand-picked. He said they were like diamonds when he went out in the fields and uh, here in the area and actually selected these stones from ranches in the area. The water represents the stream of life and the symbolism of the single raindrop returning to the ocean. The pond is Ishi no Iki, it's pond of one heart or loyalty. And that was the friendship and the unity of Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Togo. Water also greets visitors at the garden's entrance. In the Japanese tradition, you were to go and uh, purify your, your thoughts, your, uh, your hands of earthly uh, work, and, uh, uh, and your mouth, 
from uh, from possibly having said bad things about people uh, in an effort to come into the garden with a pure spirit. In planting, Mr. Saito gave Japanese style to Texas bread and adapted species. He chose foliar textures and colors to correspond and to play off each other. Understory specimens are shaped to make little clouds in the landscape. Mr. Saito wanted each plant to make its individual statement, even while blending with its companions. Along the borders, he planted monkey grass called tiger's whiskers in Japan. The Japanese technique, compact and neat, is labor intensive. We try to maintain the garden in the traditional style that Mr. Saito requested. Karen spends hours with the pruners to maintain structural serenity and a sense of order to each plant's commitment to the garden. Since the garden was once a horse corral, the plants are very energetic. On a return visit, Mr. Saito saw how his infant plants had matured. He was amazed at how large the garden had gotten. He also saw that his design held true, to invite visitors to encounter a new experience and discovery at every step. Mr. Saito accented with pagodas and lanterns that represent different periods in Japanese history. They didn't want to do what they called Japanese-ism in that they didn't want to have too many elements. They wanted it to be a very traditional and elegant blending of Japanese tradition rather than just plopping a pagoda here and saying, oh, this is Japanese. Many visitors to the Garden of Peace were born long after World War II. But from gardeners to students of history to romantics proposing marriage, the rhythm and harmony of Mr. Saito's garden is a legacy to unite every generation. It's a wonderful balance for this being the National Museum of the Pacific War to have the peace that came afterwards really be a visible spot here. Well, we're going to move from the beautiful Peace Garden in Fredericksburg to talking about bamboos, one of the classic plants of the Orient. And I'm joined by Meredith Giles from the Great Outdoors Nursery. Meredith, it's such a pleasure to have you on Central Texas Gardener. Glad to be here. One of my favorite places to hang out, the Great Outdoors. Always cool selection of things. And uh, bamboo has become kind of a specialty down there, hasn't it? Yeah, we've definitely done very well with bamboo. Um, We've carried it for quite a long time, but in the last couple of years, it's really become a, a very popular plant. Well, especially the clumping bamboos, um, which you have a, a wide variety of that you're going to be sharing with people today. But uh, what do you think attracts people to bamboo? What is it about the plant that really calls to people and is, accounts for its new popularity? Well, I think there's a, definitely an aesthetic to bamboo. It's a very beautiful plant, very graceful, the uh, flowing in the breeze mm -hmm. kind of feeling, and I think people really like that. Um, and I think, as you alluded to earlier, it kind of has that sense of the Orient, mm -hmm. uh, kind of an ancient sense, if you will. Yeah, it does. Um, and, you know, a very beautiful plant. But I think another thing that's been very attractive to people is the growth rate. Mm -hmm. because it does grow very quickly. So. Yeah, and if you need a screening, yes. there's some varieties that we're going to talk about that people will really love to learn about. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to start our little tour of the different bamboos by talking about a notorious character oh, first. Yes. <laughs> now, for years, this was the only bamboo you could find anywhere uh, in nurseries, and this is, of course, golden bamboo, and it's a lovely plant. Oh, yes. It's Great beautiful plant. plant. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like, the, like kudzu, the plant that ate the south, uh, right. it can be much more rampant than most people are prepared to deal with. Yeah. So. Well, when we say rampant, we say we're, this is a, a runner. Is there, yes. they, we talk about clumping bamboos and runners. Yes. This is definitely a runner, yeah. as is black bamboo, which is a, sometimes people believe it's a clumping, but it's not. But uh, this thing, if you're going to plant it in the ground, you really need to use precaution, right? Yes, um, you definitely need to contain it. And there are products available, like we sell a product called Bamboo Barrier, which is a 40 mil, very thick plastic that you can bury in to contain the root zone. Um, most of the Phyllostachys, which is the, the running bamboo that's most common here in Austin, 
uh, is going to run probably around 8 to 10 inches deep. And this barrier actually goes down 20 inches. So if a runner hits that, it'll turn left, turn right, turn up, but it won't turn down, go underneath, and come back the other side. Yeah, so, so. be prepared to dig a ditch if you're going to yes. plant golden bamboo, in yes. other words. Kind of a labor-intensive plant, to say yeah. the least. Or so. you can use a trench tool, which, you know, which is what I did in my own backyard. But it, uh, it, it is a lovely plant. Absolutely. Yeah, I really like it, and the black bamboo as well, but they're both runners. <laughs> Uh, the next plant that we're going to talk about is the, a timber bamboo. Yes. And this is actually a clumping form, correct? Yes, uh, giant timber bamboo, Bambusa old hamii. And one thing you have to kind of watch for, there's a lot of bamboos that are called giant timber bamboo. Okay. Um, it's kind of, in a way, almost a generic, a generic term yeah. for a very large bamboo. But Bambusa old hamii is the... Uh, what we would consider giant timber bamboo in Austin. The, one of the things you have to be careful of is you want to make sure you get a plant that is cold hardy here in Austin um, and maybe not too cold hardy so that it can actually take our heat. Mm -hmm. And this one definitely falls into that category. Okay, and this is attractive for the, the different texture of the leaves, which is a much bolder looking uh, leaf form. And uh, this gets really tall, doesn't it? Yes, this plant can get I know I've seen some in town that are probably approaching 40 feet. Um, you know, it could theoretically get taller than that. Okay. Um, and the other thing about the giant timber in particular, a lot of people do come in asking for that really big diameter comb. Mm -hmm. And it's probably one of the biggest combs that you're going to find. Okay, and when you say comb, you're just talking about the, the, the kind of this, the shoot. Yes, each one of the shoots that comes up, right. the, the vertical element. Right, well, it, they're magnificent plants. I absolutely love these, and for those people who have maybe like a McMansion move in behind them, and exactly. all of a sudden all, there are all these windows peering into your backyard, yes. here's an answer for you that is uh, actually quite a tough plant. Yeah. Yeah, there they are very good plants. They're fairly disease resistant, things mm -hmm. like that. One thing I do like to point out to people, um, and it's, it's kind of the good side and the bad side of sure. clumping bamboo. Um, the good side would be the growth rate. Mm -hmm. Nothing really grows much faster than bamboo. And if you started with a five gallon container of a bamboo that gets 20 feet tall and a five gallon shrub that gets 20 feet tall, you will have 20 feet of bamboo long before you will have 20 feet of shrub. Right, um, right. So that mature growth comes much more quickly. The downside that I found to bamboo, particularly the clumpers, is they're definitely not a native xeriscapic plant. Mm -hmm. They do need regular irrigation, particularly when we go through a drought like we had last summer. Yeah. They're going to need, you know, not every day, but uh, definitely a good mm -hmm. deep soaking. I think I've watered mine, my more established bamboos, about every 10 days or so, a good deep soaking. Found the exact same thing last year. I have a stand of black bamboo in my backyard. Had to give it a, I wouldn't say I gave it every 10 days, but I gave it some <laughs> deep drinks yeah. during the course of the winter, uh, excuse me, the summertime. The next plant that we have be um, behind you over there is something called Golden Goddess. And is this another clumper? Golden Goddess is another clumper, and that's another thing that, that is confusing to some people because Golden Bamboo, voracious runner, Golden Goddess, nice, neat little clumper. Okay. Um, it's one of the smaller clumping bamboos, probably max out around 10 feet for most people. Really good for a little privacy above a privacy fence if you don't need to, to block that three-story McMansion. Mm -hmm. um, just good to give you a little privacy up there. All right, and get, but give you the same effect of the golden bamboo of a delicate tracery kind of yes. foliage, and uh, but well behaved and doesn't require digging a ditch. So, exactly. Uh, this next one, I love this next plant, and this is a, a form with great variegation on it, and it's called silver stripe. Yes, yeah, silver stripe bamboo actually has a variegation in the leaf, a white variegation to the leaf. Um, <clears throat> You know, really nice, very uh, very arching plant. So mm -hmm. you need to give it a little room, not necessarily on the ground, but it w um, they will spread out. And yeah, sometimes they just the cans kind of fall out, if exactly. you will. Now, um, <clears throat> on most bamboos, I assume that they need pretty good sun. They are a grass family. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how much shade can they tolerate? Well, you know, Tom, I have planted um, Buddha's belly and Alphonse Carr under the canopy of a pecan tree in my yard. Mm -hmm. And they seem to be doing pretty well. Um, maybe not quite as vigorous a growth as if they got more sun, but I am finding that through last summer's drought, they were they probably held up a little better um, to the extreme heat with some shade. I definitely wouldn't put them in structural shade mm -hmm. uh, or that spot that just gets a little pop of sun in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they need to bake all day long. Okay, great. Well, um, you mentioned Buddha's belly. 
Yes. And uh, this is a, a, a lovely form. Now, how did it acquire its name? The name Buddha's Belly comes, and it's actually a, a kind of a great segue to talk about caring for bamboo. Um, so each section of a comb mm -hmm. is also called the comb, the section yeah. there. And on a Buddha's Belly plant, if it is in good soil, irrigated regularly, um, each one of those sections can get, you know, 12, 14, 16 inches long, mm -hmm. which translates into a plant that could easily get 35, 40 feet tall. Right. If the plant is very stressed or if you actually put it like in a container and, and keep the roots really bound, mm -hmm. instead of that comb segment getting 14 inches, it'll get about two inches and very fat and swollen. Okay. And so that's where Buddha's belly comes okay. from. Okay. Well, and that, that plant's actually used in bonsai sometimes to yeah. get those really exaggerated little... Well, I think it, it sounds pretty attractive, actually. Yes, beautiful plant. Yeah. So, and then that's one that you uh, recommend for the Austin area as well. It's a, yes. a clumper. Um, now, one very popular one that's really taken off in the, I'd say in the past 10 years has been an amazingly popular plant is Mexican weeping bamboo. Yes. Um, I would have to say of, of all the bamboos I've had and, and all the ones I've seen, it's probably my favorite one to grow here in Austin. A uh, very delicate, very graceful little leaf. Mm -hmm. Like you're talking about that swaying in the breeze. Oh, it's I gorgeous, mean, it's, yeah. Beautiful plant, and probably a little more sun and drought tolerant than some of the other clumpers. Actually, yeah, I used to grow some, but it got too shaded out and was a little disappointing in the shade, so it didn't do quite as well. Yeah. So, but it is a, a great plant in terms of the different options. Mm -hmm. Got to mention this last one a little bit too, uh, tiny fern. Tiny fern. Uh, tiny fern is, is a variety that I have. It's a little harder to find than most. Um, and it's actually a very interesting thing. The, the family Bambusa multiplex is a very large family or, or subfamily, I guess you will, if you will, of bamboos uh, with a lot of different things in it. Uh, tiny fern's one that only gets about four or five feet tall. Okay, so. well, great variety in the bamboos, and you can find these plants at the great outdoors. Absolutely. And uh, fun to play with, I think. It's a great plant family, and it really adds a perfect touch in a garden if you're looking for that hint of the Orient. So, yeah. Meredith, thanks for coming in, being our guest today. We'll have to have you back. I know you have lots of other plant <laughs> families that you could talk about. Absolutely. Great to be here. Thanks. All right. All right. Coming up next is our friend Skip Richter. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. This week's question regards the worm in peaches. You may have a peach tree and are watching this fruit. We've had a good year with not too many late frosts to have to mess with. And so here comes all this beautiful crop of peaches. Your mouth's watering and you're ready to go. And all of a sudden they're falling from the tree and there's a worm inside. That worm is most likely the plum curculio. The plum curculio attacks plums, peaches, and certain other fruit. And it is a little beetle-like insect. It's actually a weevil that lays an egg under a flap of skin. The egg hatches and crawls to the center and feeds around the seed. If it happens really early in the process, the fruit falls before it even gets close to ripening. But it can also happen uh, so late that you pick a ripe peach and find a worm inside. Plum curculios primarily are attacking from about the time three-fourths of the petals have fallen off the tree in the spring on up pretty close to harvest. And any control sprays that you do need to be done in that period of time between the three-fourths of the blooms falling off to about two weeks of harvest. We have information on how to control them at the office. It's too late this year to do much for your crop, although some of the late attacks may still be prevented. But plum curculio is something that's just something we have to deal with when we grow peaches and plums here in the central Texas area. This week's featured plant is pink skullcap. Pink skullcap is a very interesting plant in that it stays very low to the ground and spreads very slowly, almost like a molten lava flow moving slowly outward from the center. Uh, it's extremely hardy. It takes our heat and drought very, very well, and it's a plant that deer aren't that fond of either. So in deer prone areas, it may be one of your better choices to try out. I like the beautiful pink colored blooms. They're very attractive and they occur on through the year, especially in the spring, but on into summer as well. Pink skullcap is a good hardy plant that helps set your landscape up for the future when maybe watering isn't as easy to come by or is at least more expensive to say the least. Out in the garden, powdery mildew is continuing to plague our plants and we can avoid it by planting resistant plants. Are there a number of sprays, including some low toxicity sprays, some natural organic sprays that help control it? Some of the oil sprays do pretty well on powdery mildew and so does potassium bicarbonate as a food type product that works well in controlling powdery mildew if you continue to apply it. 
out in the annual beds where we have color, continue to fertilize them because every time you fertilize and get a little more growth and a good watering in of that fertilizer, you encourage the plant to put on some more vigorous growth and to continue to bloom. The plant needs leaves in order to produce carbohydrates which then enable it to bloom. So as they tend to sort of bloom themselves into a weakened state, by fertilizing them on, you create more foliage growth and you get better bloom in the long run. Any new plants that have been in in the last six months need to continue to be watered. We want to keep them alive during this first critical summer and keep those weeds down. They steal water, they uh, and sometimes invite disease disease problems and insect problems in and they are easily prevented with a good mulching. For more plant tips or to contact your local extension office, visit klru.org ctg. Thanks Skip. Now let's check in with John Dronkel for Backyard Basics. Hello gardening friends, welcome to Backyard Basics. You know some of the letters that come into Central Texas Gardener um, are from new gardeners and they have some questions, some real basic questions that sometimes I assume that people know and um, they don't, especially the new gardeners. And so one of the questions is related to what's the difference between mulch and compost? Well this is one of the many mulches that are out there and it's usually a ground wood, this is a recycled wood from the area and I like to buy local so uh, this is a uh, recycled wood when they're clearing some area maybe the uh, development's going in and so they'll go in there and they'll uh, take oak wood and cedar wood as they clear and that's what this is it's allowed to sit for a little while and brown out nicely and it looks really good on the ground and it has some organic matter in there that's fine like a compost, but not a whole lot. This is the compost right here. This is a nice finished product. I encourage you to make it at home, but you can find it commercially also. It's a real pretty product. It's nice and loose, and this is what we work into the soil. When you've got a hard, compacted soil like this one, and you're beating it with something, trying to open it up, that's not enough. When you finish loosening it a little bit, then you go in there and work in a generous amount of compost. And that means about a three inch layer of compost on top of it, maybe a little bit more. And so then you'll work that in. And the thing to do really is to take a garden fork. A nice garden fork is what you need to work into the soil. It's the best way to work it. And you want to get one that has some nice strong tines on it. If you buy a cheap one, the tines may bend on you, especially in that hard soil in the first go round. So you want a nice sturdy one. You know, some of the garden forks are consumer items and you consume them over and over and over over time. So go out and get yourself a good one and it'll last for many years and it'll become your gardening friend also. So um, this is what we're gonna use to work it into the bed. And then once we do that, we see the soil getting really nice and loose. You can just stick your hand down in the soil and that change occurs over time. It's not the fastest thing in the garden. It's really something that takes some time and you repeat that. You know, if you put in three inches of compost, whether it's the spring or the fall, in the next season you put in a third of that amount. So you'll go back and add about an inch of compost just to maintain it. Now compost can be used as a mulch and you put it right on top when the beds are finished and it'll make a nice mulch also. So. The compost also brings in nutrients. There are some good nutrients in here, some trace minerals, some phosphorus, a little bit of nitrogen. So you are bringing in nutrients to the garden when you do this. It's not everything. You can use a good organic fertilizer out there. It depends on what you're growing. But um, this brings in nutrients. But most importantly, it brings life to the soil. And that's what we're looking for. Some of these compacted soils are um, anaerobic, actually. No air is getting in there. And it's the aerobic organisms that make the compost in the garden one of the more essential things to build it. For the organic gardener or any kind of gardener, using the compost is the key to the success in that garden. Some people will put a little bit of this in a container, a five gallon container for example, down in the bottom, stir it up, let it settle down 24 hours later, take the compost tea out of there and wet the soil with it also. You can put it with water at about the color of iced tea, you know, you blend it a little bit that way, put it in your water can and go up and down the garden. So, 
This is mulch, a nice way to finish off the garden, drop the soil temperature rather dramatically, keep weeds suppressed, and uh, keep moisture in the soil. That's one of the more important things. The compost will act like a sponge and hold the moisture in the soil also and keep it nice and friable. And you'll see that you'll know one of the secrets of the organic gardener, that compost is the most essential thing that you can add to the garden and then you mulch on top of it. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgold. I'll see you next time. For more tips, online video, and the CTG blog, check out klru.org slash CTG. Next week, Chris Corby, publisher of Texas Gardener Magazine, shares insider tips for getting through the summer. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. Visit klru.org slash CTG to learn more about today's program, upcoming events, and to sign up for our electronic newsletter. Check out John's how-to tips and visit Trisha's Corner for ideas inside and out. Get growing at klru.org ctg.